We are about to embark on a journey not only to a time 2,500 years ago, to the beginnings of Western civilization, but straight into the nature of consciousness itself. And it is all presented by a human who was a magician, a healer, a prophet, a politician, a philosopher, a priest, a poet, and the father of logic. Also, he is attributed to determine the Earth's true round shape, as well as dividing the Earth into five zones. Two cold zones at the North and South Poles, a hot zone in the middle at the equator, and two temperate regions in between. All of this is revealed throughout the poem, as you will see, crafted through an idiomatic human, a human just like us, named Parmenides. This should be good. Not only will I read the entire poem that's available today with a modern translation, but I'll also provide commentary to bring some of the poem's hidden symbols and meanings to light. And for those who know basic Jungian terms, I'll show you how this poem mirrors Jung's psychological or metaphysical statements 2,400 years after Parmenides wrote them. Terms such as the self and individuation weave themselves in and out of this poem. And it is as if Jung's purpose was not to bring us into a new age, but reconnect us back to our roots. This video not only restores Jung's message, a message many New Agers and rationing egos have abused, but also bring forth the true message of somebody who very little truly know much about, yet is known as one of the first ancient Greek philosophers. So, back to the roots we head, where it all began in the West. This is Fragments of Eternity, Parmenides' poem on nature. How long will we go on looking for truth everywhere outside ourselves? How many books do we need to read? How many people do we have to ask? We already have everything we need to know, deep in the darkness inside ourselves. And our longing, if we dare to follow it all the way, is what turns us inside out until we find the sun and the moon and the stars inside. If there is one force which we are all influenced by, a force strong enough to move you, it is longing. And it is here, longing, where we begin. We all long. We long for nutrition. We long for security. We long for relationships and accomplishments. Longing is life, and life is longing. A word that is one with longing is desire. We desire. We long. We are moved and shaped by this force. Desiring began as an instinct in childhood. It begins unconsciously, comes through one's being, and since, in infancy, consciousness is not yet developed, ordered, the archetypal conscious reaction is to cry. And cry infants do so well. Infants long without knowing their longing. It is as natural as being itself. It's eternal. This natural desire begins to become filled out and externally bound throughout childhood and adolescence as subjective consciousness begins ordering its world. Instead of just the instinct to eat, we have our preferences to fulfill the desire of hunger. Instead of getting to know and tending the instinct for safety, we have our own safety items, spaces, and defense mechanisms to fulfill it. Slowly, Necessary instincts become subjective conscious needs. By the time we reach adulthood, most individuals have distorted desire through bindings in the world and lost the essence of that original instinct of desire, that instinct of what one truly needs. This is a major issue in our times. As we continue to distract ourselves with more materials, we continue losing our grounding to our essence. It becomes a shadow, still with us, but underneath the built reality on top of it. Addictions and attachments develop just to keep the surface alive, and one becomes bound to their own illusion. We've lost that true sense of pure longing, of pure being. Peter Kingsley, who will be featured throughout this video, wrote about this longing in his paper called 
as far as longing can reach. If we can bear to face our longing instead of finding endless ways to keep satisfying it or trying to escape it, it begins to show us a glimpse of what lies behind the scenes of this world we think we live in. It opens up a devastating perspective where everything is turned on its head, where fulfillment becomes a limitation, accomplishment turns into a trap, and it does this with an intensity that scrambles our thoughts and forces us straight into the present. Longing is the movement and the calling of our deepest nature. It is the cry of the wolf, the power of the lion, the fluttering of all the birds inside us. And if we can find the courage to face it, it will take us back to where we belong. But just like animals, this longing is dangerous as well as beautiful. Longing is the powerhouse of our being. And on this path of return, it breaks everything except what is unbreakable. It shatters all the man-made structures that we tried to build up around it and place in its way. It washes away the future and past and leaves us with nothing but eternity. For longing is the creator of time, and time can never contain it. I begin with longing because Parmenides' poem and everything he is to reveal begins with this pure longing. As we will see, Parmenides... Again, over 2,500 years ago, achieved the state of being that most, if not all, lose along their path in life. Trapped up in their own ego, in the material, the immaterial being, true consciousness, the self, gets lost and covered over. And in order to uncover the covering, a purification and sacrifice must take place. A washing off of the muck of the bodily attachments and addictions and the mental opinions and false beliefs in order to reclaim that true essence within. And this washing off, this cleansing, this purifying and sacrifice is the beginnings of a process known in Jungian psychology as individuation. But as I read this poem, keep in mind that Parmenides is at a point of individuation where he has stepped aside. He's washed off and purified to allow the inner to share its wisdom. His longings not distorted by his own wishes, his ego, rather it's one with thyself. And this longing still moves Parmenides without his will to move it, just as longing moves any mortal. The only difference is where this longing takes him and what it reveals. And to complete this section on longing, I want to add that it is just this, longing, which Jung himself states in the Red Book that led him on his inner journey. Jung, after following his outer longings, writes to begin the Red Book, I have achieved honor, power, wealth, knowledge, and every human happiness. Then my desire for the increase of these trappings ceased. The desire ebbed from me, and horror came over me. I felt the spirit of the depths, but I did not understand him. Yet he drove me on with unbearable inner longing, and I said, My soul, where are you? Now the only thing left to do before reading his poem is to briefly introduce Parmenides himself. Parmenides is a philosopher prior to the well-known Socrates and Plato, influencing their works tremendously. He is one with many titles a magician, a healer, a prophet, a teacher, a politician, a philosopher, a priest, and the father of logic. Yes, he is what we in the West attribute to one of the first, if not the first, to introduce logic into culture. But of course, as many egos tend to do, just as it does with longing, we've lost the essence of what Parmenides' logic truly means. Keep this in mind as I read the fragments, because if this is the source of our logic and reasoning today, there's been a key feature lost in the 2,500 years since. Parmenides lived in present-day Italy, a town called Elia, which was a Greek colony during his time. Speaking of his time, it was said to be between the late 6th and early 5th century BC. He is grouped with the pre-Socratic philosophers in addition to being the founder of the Eliatic school. For those familiar with Zeno, Parmenides was his teacher, 
and the philosophy of the Eleatics will show up throughout the poem, so I'll leave those details for the commentary. And with this short introduction, I'll now read in full Parmenides' only text remaining today. And what is available today is just a fragment of itself, as a good portion of this poem did not survive over the years. The only way these fragments are available today is through other sources quoting parts of this poem in their own work. So for the English translation used in this video, I'm going to use two different versions. The first is a translation by Peter Kingsley in his book Reality, a source that I'll also use throughout the commentary following the poem. Everything else not translated by Peter Kingsley will be provided through a translation by Patricia Kurd. So with that brief introduction, enjoy Parmenides' poem, which has been given the title, On Nature. The mares that carry me as far as longing can reach rode on. Once they had come and fetched me onto the legendary road of the divinity that carries the man who knows through the vast and dark unknown. And on I was carried as the mares, aware just where to go, kept carrying me straining at the chariot, and young women led the way. And the axle and the hubs let out the sound of a pipe blazing from the pressure of the two well-rounded wheels at either side, as they rapidly led on. Young women, girls, daughters of the sun, who had left the mansions of the night for the light, and pushed back the veils from their faces with their hands. There are the gates of the pathways of night and day, held fast in between the lintel above and a threshold of stone, and they reach up into the heavens, filled with gigantic doors, and the key that now open, now lock, are held fast by justice, she who demands exact returns. And with soft, seductive words, the girls cunningly persuaded her to push back immediately, just for them, the bar that bolts the gates. And as the doors flew open, making the bronze axles with their pegs and nails spin, now one, now the other, in their pipes, they created a gaping chasm, straight through and on the girls held fast their course, for the chariot and horses, straight down the road. And the goddess welcomed me kindly, and she took my right hand in hers, and spoke these words as she addressed me. Welcome, young man, partnered by immortal charioteers, reaching our home with the mares that carry you. For it was no hard fate that sent you traveling this road, so far away from the beaten track of humans, but rightness and justice. And what's needed is for you to learn all things, both the unshaken heart of persuasive truth and the opinions of mortals, in which there's nothing that can truthfully be trusted at all. But even so, this too you will learn, how beliefs based on appearance ought to be believable as they travel all through all there is. I will do the talking, and it's up to you to carry my words once you have heard them. What I will tell you is which roads of inquiry and which roads alone exist for thinking. The one road that is and is not possible not to be is the way of persuasion, for persuasion is truth's attendant. As for the other that is not and is necessary not to be, this, I can tell you, is a path from which no news returns. For there is no way you can recognize what is not. There is no traveling that path, or telling anything about it. For what exists for thinking and being are one and the same. See how it is that things far away are firmly present to your mind. For however much you want to, there is no way you will manage to cut being off from clinging fast to being. To me it doesn't matter from where I begin. In fact, there I will return again. What exists for saying and for thinking must be. 
for it exists for it to be, but nothing does not exist. You ponder that. This is the first road of inquiry that I hold you back from, but then I hold you back as well from one that mortals fabricate, twin heads knowing nothing. For helplessness in their chests is what steers their wandering minds as they are carried along in a daze, deaf and blind at the same time, indistinguishable, undistinguishing crowds who reckon that being and non-being are the same and not the same, and for all of them, the route they follow is a path that keeps turning backward on itself. For in no way may this prevail, that things that are not are. From this path of inquiry, hold your mind away, and don't let much experienced habit force you to guide your sightless eye and echoing ear and tongue along this way but judge by reasoning the hard-fought proof exhibited by me. There is only one tale of a path left to tell, that is, and along this way there are many, many signs, as well as being birthless, it's also deathless, and whole, and of a single kind, and unmoving, and neither is it incomplete. It never was, and never will be, because it is now, altogether one, holding to itself. For what possible birth of it will you look for? In what way could it have grown? From what? To say and to think from what is not is something I won't allow you, because there is no saying or thinking that is not. And besides, if it started out from nothing, what could have made it come into being later rather than sooner? So it must either be completely or not be. Neither will the strength of persuasive proof ever permit anything to come into being out of non-being alongside of it. And this is why justice has not allowed freedom for creation or destruction by relaxing her constraining grip. Instead, she holds fast. And the decision in this matter comes down to this. Is or is not. But it has already been decided. The judgment has already been passed as necessary that the second of these paths is to be dismissed as unthinkable and unnameable because it's no true way, while the other is to be allowed to be and really be. And how could it be that being could be at some later time? How could it come into being? For if it came to be, it is not. And if at some point it intends to be, then again it is not. So it is that creation has been extinguished, and of destruction there is not a word to be heard. And also, there is no dividing it, because it is all alike. There is nothing more here that could stop it from holding together with itself, or less there. But all of it is full of being. So it is that everything is continuous with everything, because being draws near to being. And what's more, Motionless in the bonds of great feathers, it has no beginning or end, because creation and destruction have wandered far, far away. And true and persuasive evidence is what has driven them out. It stays just the same in the same unaltered state, lies by itself on its own, and so remains constantly where it is. For mighty necessity holds it fast in the fetters of a bond that shuts it in from all around. And this is why it is not right for it to be incomplete. For there is nothing that it wants or lack, but non-being would lack everything. And what exists for thinking is the same as the cause of thought, for you won't find thinking without the being in which it has been uttered. For there is nothing else and will be nothing else apart from being, because fate has bound it to be whole, unmoving. Its name shall be everything, Every single name that mortals invented, convinced that they are all true. Birth and death, existence, non-existence, change of place, alteration of bright colors. Because there is an ultimate binding limit, this means it's perfectly complete. Just like the bulk of a sphere, neatly rounded off from each direction. Equally matched from the middle on every side. And from this point on... Learn the opinions of mortals by listening to the deceptive ordering of my words. 
for they have established two forms to name in their judgments, of which it is not right to name one. In this they have gone astray, and they distinguished things opposite in body, and established signs apart from one another. For one, the ethereal fire of flame, mild, very light, the same as itself in every direction, but not the same as the other, but the other one in itself is opposite, dark night, a dense and heavy body. I declare to you all the ordering as it appears, so that no mortal judgment may ever overtake you. But since all things have been named light and night, and the things which accord with their powers have been assigned to these things and those, all is full of light and obscure night together, of both equally, since if neither the one nor the other is present, there is nothing. You shall know the nature of the aether, and all the signs of the aether, and the destructive deeds of the shining sun's pure torch, and whence they came to be, and you shall learn the wandering deeds of the round-faced moon, and its nature, and you shall know also the surrounding heaven, from what it grows, and how necessity led and shackled it to hold the limits of the stars. How earth and sun and moon and the aether that is common to all and the Milky Way and the furthest Olympus and the hot force of the stars surged forth to come to be. For the narrower wreaths were filled with unmixed fire, the ones next to them with night, but a due amount of fire is inserted among it, and in the middle of these is the goddess who governs all things. For she rules over hateful birth and union of all things, sending the female to unite with male, and in opposite fashion, male to female. First of all gods, she contrived love. Night shining, foreign light, wandering around earth. Always looking toward the rays of the sun. In fact, each man governs a mixture of organs subject to errors, so a mind governs men. In fact, the same thinking thing in men, both in all and in each, is the structural substance of the organs, whose main part is the thought. The goddess brought boys into being on the right side of the uterus, girls on the left. As soon as women and men mingle the seeds of love that come from their veins, a formative power fashions well-constructed bodies from their two differing bloods, if it maintains a balance. For if when the seed is mingled the powers clash, and do not create a single power in the body resulting from the mixture, with double seed they will dreadfully disturb the nascent sex of the child. In this way, according to opinion, doxa, these things have grown, and now are, and afterwards, after growing up, will come to an end, and upon them humans have established a name to mark each one. You have to be careful and truly be aware of everything that's happening. In this commentary, I'll go at a rather fast pace on some points, while dragging a few out. My goal is not to go too far off tangent, because then we'll lose the movement of the poem. Before beginning, I do have to note it's rather sad that this is where philosophy began. A true sense of Logos, as well as Eros, has been lost as ignorance and opinions rule our times. While modern scholars and amateur seekers are stuck rationing and reading their way to knowledge, Parmenides provides an account where consciousness itself is given its true respect. And through this trust in the Logos, what is beautiful is that Parmenides far exceeded the mechanical scientists of our times. While many have finally shifted over to the space known as quantum, Parmenides seems to be speaking of it 
again, 2,500 years before the scientists ever crafted their myths about the atom. So as philosopher Martin Heidegger remarked, Parmenides' poem continually deserves more thought. Let us proceed. The poem begins with Parmenides being carried by the mares which carry him on a chariot. And the field is longing, the essence which we began the introduction with. On the chariot, Parmenides is carried not only by horses, but young women or daughters of the sun. Anyone familiar with Greek mythology will notice that this may allude to Helios, the sun god, as he is known to travel on its chariot from the underworld, rising in the east and then setting west back into the underworld. One could say his daughters lead Parmenides, leaving their home in the mansion of night for the light. There are also many references that connect Helios with the god Apollo. And I say this because Parmenides may not be evoking Helios, but Apollo, as Parmenides was a priest of Apollo. This was verified in 1962 from an excavation which found a statue with the label Parmenides, son of Pyres, Oleades, Physikos. Pyres was Parmenides' biological father. Physikos refers to him being a healer and scientist, and that middle term, Oleides, refers to being a son or priest of Apollo. And as one takes in this poem, one will notice that it mirrors a message that one would receive at a temple known as Delphi. As a woman would utter a message, usually in the form of a riddle, to such seekers. And the god of the temple of Delphi, of course, is Apollo. This is not only true at Delphi, of this feminine role providing a divine message, but throughout many temples dedicated to Apollo. For example, the third largest structure in ancient Greek times, in Didyma, just outside the port city of Miletus, mirrors this symbolism. This temple of Apollo had three doors, two on the left and right for anybody to enter, and a third large door in the middle, where only the priests may enter. They entered a space known as the vestibule, where the priest of Apollo would decipher utterances by female prophets who were in trance-like states. And continuing with the first fragment, it's not Parmenides steering the chariot as his longing takes him. He's being carried and led. It is as if his longing was pure, not acting out of his own fulfillment, but rather within the intelligence of itself. And I'm not saying we shouldn't will, as you will see the importance of this subject shortly, but this idea of being carried, led, at the beginning of the poem is significant to reflect on. It is as if Parmenides is aware of that true hidden intelligence within longing itself. Adding on to this, one will notice that he is not led by strong men, carried by a masculine force, but it's rather the daughters of the sun. This hints at that feminine element we began with, a function of Eros that leads the way. And this is a rather odd statement to reflect on, as this is our father of logic. I say this because logic and reasoning is usually symbolized by the masculine. But as we come to see, this feminine theme continues. For now, it's important to say that Parmenides is not psychologically possessed by the feminine, but rather he has far begun the process of individuation, where he sees the pure sense of Logos and Eros. I say this because he is described as one who knows in this fragment. And as well, we see the significant symbolism of the veils being pulled back. The symbolism of the pulling back of the veil can be traced back throughout myths and religions. But to speak in terms of consciousness, this resembles one who is beyond Plato's divided line, beyond belief towards understanding and knowing. And also in this section, and throughout his journey to the goddess, one should note the visual and audio cues, such as the sound of the pipes and pace of movement. We continue fragment one as Parmenides is carried to the path of night and day, where he approaches a gate where he meets Justice, she who demands exact returns, the gatekeeper. And Justice is yet another feminine figure, besides the daughters of the sun, who carried him. So before speaking about this pathway to night and day, and where Parmenides has traveled, I'd like to add a little bit more on this feminine element. 
Our tendency in the West, possibly for over 2,500 years since this time, has been dominated by a masculine culture. And yet, this poem is not masculine, reasoning that we've grown accustomed to, but rather, and humbly, there's a different sense of reality that's been lost over our conscious times. Think about all the religions that follow after this poem. All these religions have a male dominance, and especially in cultures and society through businesses and the like. And this is, again, not to say there's anything wrong with the masculine energy, but without a connection to the feminine and understanding of that other, life becomes tyrannical and inflated. Now, of course, if consciousness is tied to the masculine, it would make sense that culture has become more masculine as our species is becoming more conscious. This is where Jung comes into place because he was bringing us back to the unconscious, back to the feminine, back to the other to allow us to be whole. This is the power of both Jung and Parmenides as wholeness is a key feature in their metaphysics. And while it's easy to get trapped in one's own consciousness, one's own ego, the feminine aspect of Parmenides, knowing him as one who knows, truly shows that the linkage between the conscious and unconscious mind have been met by Parmenides. This is the root synthesis of individuation, and I believe this is the key feature of which allows the logos, the true logos, the knowing, to come through one's being. Now, the only thing left to add is where Parmenides has been taken. One may say the unconscious, or specifically Jung's collective unconscious, but this wasn't known in the times of Parmenides. While he didn't name it specifically, I, as well as Peter Kingsley and many others, suggest that he went to the underworld, or Hades. Again, the daughters left the night to the light, say the unconscious to Parmenides' consciousness, and then led him back to the gates of night and day. And they go straight through the gates and down the road, which leads away from the light. This may be confusing to some, as most say that the path to truth is a path from the darkness to the light. But this is the reversal, as it is from the light to the darkness. If Parmenides wasn't able to handle what Jung described as the shadows, he wouldn't be accepted into the gates, let alone carried. Before the heights and the light, one must face one's ignorance, their own darkness, their shadows, so consciousness may be purely whole. Otherwise, one will be fated like Helios' son, Phaethon. Instead of making it across the sky in the chariot like his father, he died on his journey in his ignorance and pride, scorching the earth along the way. So while many think the heights are where truth is found, this poem, as well as Jung's psychology, says the way to the true light begins in the dark, in the depths, as the only way up is down. At this point in the poem, everything shifts from Parmenides' journey traveling to the goddess to her speaking her message from here on out. The divine revelation has begun. First, she greets Parmenides as a young man. Now, many may think this means a physical, biological age, but when you look at the Greek, the word that she greets him with is kuros. And for those who know the mysteries, such as the Illusion Mysteries, the initiates were called kuros. So we could see the initial contact with the goddess that it's all pointing to a sign of initiation, with the initiate being Parmenides. And while many may think this is a stretch, I don't see how Jung's journey wasn't this same kind of initiation, especially if one follows his journey through Libra Novus, the first book of the Red Book, of which I've created a series on. If one read the book or watched my series, Jung didn't just meditate and receive enlightenment, didn't consciously choose anything, but initially he went through a purification and a struggle to be pure enough to go on this journey. And then through his inner experiences, you'll notice he was inducted or initiated into the mysteries of his self, into the mysteries of what he's called the mysterium through his active imaginations. And it takes an awareness that's not distorted by the ego, as we see Jung and Parmenides have stepped aside to allow it to speak. 
individuation, the illusion mysteries, and this poem all speak to the idea of an initiation, which is the same as receiving any true intelligence, logos, or gnosis. Parmenides is far off from the beaten track of humans, and it's not hard fate, but rightness and justice that he is there. This idea of not being hard fate is the goddess telling Parmenides he's not dead because he is there in the underworld, in the world of the dead. So to Parmenides, at first, it may seem like he's died on this journey, but the goddess initially tells him it's not a hard fate, but actually his work, we'll say, rightness and justice. And again, I have to connect to Jung as throughout Jung's Red Book experience, he kept going to the underworld through his active imaginations, interacting with the dead themselves. Now, for those familiar with Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, this may seem like that journey. And it is to an extent, as long as one isn't consciously choosing to make the journey. If one says one day, I'm going into the shadows, I'm going to the underworld, I'm going to make the hero's journey myself, then you'll be mistaken. Because as with Jung and Parmenides, the journeys happened on their own terms. This is a key point to grasp. Will's important for purification, for sacrifice, for allowing one's being to be. But when the journey occurs, when revelation comes through, one must be able to be still. And it is just this stillness that's not spoken of once in this poem, but is throughout the entire piece. After being introduced to the goddess, Parmenides is then instructed on how to proceed. And this is another significant insight. The goddess tells Parmenides that she needs him to learn all things, both the unshaken heart of persuasive truth and the opinions of mortals. Before looking at each, the most important thing to highlight is that he is to learn all things, not just truth, but half-truths. One may ask, why is this? If one has truth, why would one need to know opinions of mortals? I suggest this is because of the ease of becoming fooled, of becoming bound in ignorance, in illusion. And this is because the goddess herself says nothing can be trusted at all. Finally, this section ends with a bit of a confusing statement. Peter Kingsley adds his own thoughts on this point of beliefs being believable if they pass through all there is by writing what he Parmenides is saying is that human opinions can possess a certain validity provided that they reach all the way through the world of appearances to its furthest limit, as long as they touch the ultimate boundaries of existence. Continuing, you could say that his goddess has something of an ulterior motive when she tells him that human opinions and beliefs will only be trustworthy, believable, if they are able to reach as far as the ultimate limits of existence. For those limits are exactly where she is. They are where her home is, are where the daughters of the sun have brought Parmenides to meet her. To her, ordinary human opinions are utterly unbelievable in themselves and only become trustworthy when they reach the furthest limit of existence. He continues, Unless every journey we make brings us face to face with her, We are going nowhere. Our existence is beyond belief. And in the last resort, unless we encounter the goddess of death with every step we take, we are totally lost. Fragment 2 comes to the heart of Parmenides' philosophy. And what is absolutely mind-boggling is that most moderns trace logic and reasoning back to Parmenides. Yet his philosophy, according to his poem, was never worked out, never thought through following strict rules of logic. It is, one can say, a revelation. This changes the view not only on what logic and reason meant to the pre-Socratics like Parmenides and his student Zeno, but also aligns with the idea of the mysteries. I say this because Parmenides is told to be aware, as well as take her words with him. There's no room for questioning her, let alone thinking through her message as it is spoken. This is the whole sense of logic and reasoning, of true intelligence that we've lost in our rationing West. 
This scene seems to connect to Jung's visionary experiences in the Red and Black books, where he's told by Elijah during one of his most intense inner experiences at the conclusion of Liber Primus to write down exactly everything he sees. And speaking of Jung, in order to carry her words, in order to take the one route that is, one must be able to embrace wholeness. Because the word is, is both light and dark, good and evil, heaven and hell. And this idea of wholeness, just like silence and stillness, is spoken throughout the poem without being spoken of. Any true enlightenment can only happen when one is bearing what is. This route, this one road that the goddess provides Parmenides. And what is, being able to grasp it, is the ability to stand or hang in the middle. Which is a theme that Jung highlights in the Red Book. A state he felt when bearing his visionary experiences. We all know wholeness lies at the root of his psychology. And this is exactly the road that the goddess is speaking on. That is, is. What is, is. It is not what is good, what is full, what is beautiful, what is not evil, what is godly. No, it is what is. And what is, is divine. And that is wholeness. And the other road, the one that doesn't exist, cannot even be thought of. What could exist outside of what is? You cannot speak about what is not, nor recognize what is not. Leaving us with the famous notion, is. This is expanded on as we get into fragment 8. Fragment 3 is just one mere sentence, but says so much more. It is so easy to gloss over a sentence, but when you actually stop and sit and read it over, again and again, and understand what it is saying... It's amazing how much you can miss. This is what I will call a psychological section of the poem. Just sit with it, ponder it, it'll grow on you. What I'll add on fragment three is a quote from Peter Kingsley speaking on this section. He wrote in reality, We have built a wall between thinking and reality. All these distinctions come tumbling down. For him, any thought is about something that exists is just as real, as perfect, a part of reality as any other. Its criterion of rightness lies not in its relation to something solid, concrete, objective in the external world, but in itself. Every thought is its own validation. It needs no confirmation outside it. Whatever we are able to think is true. He continues... There is no understanding this by trying to think it through or work it out, because anything whatsoever that you happen to think about will be true. There is no thinking about thinking, because that way you fall straight into the world of thought you were trying to define. There is no arguing, because you were only arguing with yourself. The only possible way of understanding is by standing back in the stillness that lies underneath the thinking and sees things as they really are. It's like watching hundreds of colors, each of them trying to persuade you it happens to be the most important one, then stepping back and seeing they all form a single rainbow. Thoughts in themselves are always leading to separation and division, but all thoughts together are a single whole. We are our own enemy. Everything is one, and there is no need to struggle for anything at all because whatever we think already exists, nothing to fulfill. Nothing to fear. It is as if, for Parmenides, the goddess and Kingsley's remarks signify for the ego, it's not about growing consciousness through consuming information, grabbing knowledge, but about the ability to perceive correctly, to truly be aware of what is. With these reflections, we continue. In fragment four, there's another beautiful psychological point followed by a philosophical point. This is, in my opinion, not only sight, objects outside of you, but also relating to past memories, as when they are triggered, they are present just as they are occurring for the first time. This is another fragment where deep reflection will help lead you to see more, unravel its true meaning. Parmenides is really speaking on that idea of oneness in this fragment. And in addition... 
Continuing with this theme, the fragment states that you cannot cut off being from being. And this is so important. Being, being, say the one, or in Jung's terms, the collective unconscious, cannot be cut off from being, or say one's consciousness. Just like a wave which attempts to break free from the ocean, it crashes onto shore and then is sucked back into its source. There's no separations. Things seem to be separate but truly all is one. And this may be a leap, but I see a connection between these two sentences and the alchemical prima materia or prime substance of all. Science has been after this substance since its existence. We've now found smaller building blocks of reality in the quantum world, which correlates to many ideas Parmenides speaks on. So if one really truly thinks about ideas in the quantum, such as entanglement, you could see it hinted at 2,500 years before. I do find it rather interesting how science will not look at myth or a poem, yet are myth producers themselves. Fragment 5 basically speaks for itself. And then we'll continue with fragment 6, beginning with the first sentence. What exists for saying and for thinking must be. This, taken literally would mean that if you can think or speak about a shark that walks on land, it must be. And while this may work in some theories in quantum science, say in some parallel universe, this goes a bit deeper. Put yourself in a situation when you're not thinking but a thought arises. Or suppose you ran into someone unexpected and had a discussion, when you say something you wish you didn't say. In both situations, Will is not in charge. It is just as Jung would claim any dream must be. There is a reality in everything, a divinity in everything. And the true beauty of all this is that if you only accept the positive and deny the other, all one's doing is denying their own selves. If a negative vibe, if you like to call it that, comes through, that means it's real. It exists. And all the slogans, the mantras, the fires, the rocks, the distractions will never transform it. This goddess's logic is ruthless, and it requires this ruthlessness to purify, to be. Speaking of, this goddess is about to destroy us, humans, and it's rather humorous. Again, the goddess connects mortals to fabrications, to lies, to illusion, this idea of them being good at making Maya. And also, she calls them twin heads, knowing nothing. The truth is tough to swallow. And it doesn't seem since the 2,500 years since this poem that the masses have changed much. So when you see her speaking of mortals, she's truly speaking of us. And again, I'm going to push something a little far, but speaking on twin heads. Earlier, I spoke of Parmenides having his conscious and unconscious mind synthesize, which is a sign of individuation. And I see a twin head as somebody that has split across their conscious and unconscious mind, where they're not connected to that essence, and they're truly a tyrant of an ego, believing its own illusion. The truth about us humans continues as the goddess says that the helplessness in their chest steers their wandering minds, while they are carried in a daze. And there's actually a similarity with this idea of them being carried to Parmenides being carried, but the whole thing is inverted. Parmenides is carried, but he is anything but deaf and blind. And he's not in a daze, but highly conscious. Think about the beginning with the noises and the visuals. I don't know if this was his intention, but there seems to be something here. And while Parmenides is anything but helpless on his journey while he's carried, the mortals are helpless in their chests as they're carried along with this false sense of longing that we spoke on in the beginning of this video. So it's interesting to see two different sides of this longing. One that's more helpful instead of helpless and moving him in a highly aware manner where he could see and he can hear compared to the mortal who is helpless and being steered by their wandering mind, carried in a daze, unable to see or hear. And to tap it off, many humans think they're going far. They're moving around but they're actually making no conscious progress at all. And that is this idea of a path that keeps turning backwards on itself. 
So again, we can compare Parmenides with the mortals as the mortals are physically moving around but consciously going nowhere. Whereas Parmenides is consciously going off the far beaten track but physically hasn't moved. Again, in fragment seven, the senses return. And this is why I don't believe it's a mistake because we see again the mortals having issues with their eyes and ears. Many know that this idea is a theme throughout many myths, especially religious stories. But what is the significance? This must all be a key to consciousness. And it's obvious that they are important or else Parmenides wouldn't be repeating these same ideas. Peter Kingsley speaks on this idea in an interview, stating, Both Parmenides and Empedocles in their poems deliver devastating critiques of the human condition, and anyone who reads them superficially might conclude that they don't hold out much hope for mankind. To be sure, they say our senses are unreliable, but that's only the beginning. As I explain in great detail in reality, both actually give a whole system of exercises, very specific training programs, yoga techniques, meditation practices. These practices are still there in the Greek texts from the dawn of Western culture, and they are based on teaching us how to come to our senses, how to allow our senses to open, like buds. In addition, another beautiful statement is added, and by gosh, are our times plagued by it. And this is the idea of must experienced habit. I will not go off on this because I could spend a whole nother video speaking on this topic, but this is the idea that consciousness can become programmed rather easily. We all know that subjectiveness can get stuck and bound to their own illusion. And if one can't ever break their own bounds, how could one reach the bounds of consciousness? The ultimate limits of what is. This is the shift to where one can really begin to get this message. This message on how this poem speaks directly on consciousness. It's something that we've lost and it has become a stain on our own culture. Look at us. I'll keep my thoughts to myself, but there is an illness plaguing souls from the bottom to the top, programmed by their own faults, as well as the propaganda consumer world of today. And yet, 2,500 years ago, there were individuals like Parmenides doing true inner work. And then you look 2,500 years later and we have this new ageism, this one big fluffy show. He knew about this much experienced habit, this programming that happens so easily to the common folk. And this is the beauty of why the goddess speaks about both the unshaken heart of persuasive truth and the opinions of mortals because those opinions are what bind us. Now at the end of this fragment, there's a much disputed sentence, as many cannot seem to grasp what she's saying. Upon my own meditations, I see that if Parmenides was instructed earlier to take her words and carry them, then I don't see how there is any time to judge her reason. Peter Kingsley also mirrors this, but goes a step further and says it has been handed down to us incorrectly. He goes through a whole chapter on this reasoning, and it's well worth the read, which he concludes, You were either with her, the goddess, or you were not. Either you follow the signs on this path, or you will be left behind, with the ghosts at the fork in the road. We arrive at fragment eight, and this is the fragment where Parmenides' idea of what is, of truth, is truly developed. And in this fragment, one may see connections to such ideas in the Bhagavad Gita. As the Bhagavad Gita states, non-being cannot arise and being cannot pass away. These ideas in the Bhagavad Gita were written after Parmenides' statements. And I'm not saying he's the first to bring this information forth. But it's a significant fact that he wrote a poem on the nature of oneness without much reference, without a specific ideology that he's relating to. It's as if he truly grasped it individually, without a dogma, without a discipline, and was able to see the true reality of reality itself. Fragment 8 truly illustrates the path of is, of being. If creation and destruction are gone, all that is left is eternity. And it is persuasive evidence which casts out birth and death. That persuasive evidence being eternal truth. 
It is as if one peels anything back, including their selves, and removed anything created, anything impure. At the deepest level, all that remains is being. Brahman, the Jungian self. Think about it. If being is this sense of fullness, then what would one need to be in order to be one with it? That would be empty. Emptiness. An empty ego, which some call ego death, is that idea of an ego truly, purely being aware of the fullness that is. Being is truly eternal, as it doesn't start from nothing. Imagine claiming a beginning to eternity, then one would have to ask when it would end. For example, the Big Bang, a nonsensical theory to Parmenides for a beginning of the universe, as he would then ask what was there before the Big Bang. And as I said, science is beginning to look into the world Parmenides is speaking on. And they could finally answer now that gravitational waves precede any Big Bang. And while the Big Bang may have kicked off our observable universe, it's no answer as to a true beginning. Parmenides' student Zeno uses his paradoxes to destroy this idea of common thought and reasoning and gets one truly reasoning about being. His famous tortoise and Achilles paradox discusses one of the points that Parmenides brings up. That is the motionless nature of being. We continue on fragment 8. The first sentence here is one to ponder. The second adds more to grasp. Peter Kingsley highlights an interesting take to this. As he writes in reality, She, the goddess, has already explained that whatever exists for thinking, the object of all our thoughts and perceptions, is being. But now we are being told something else, that the initial cause of thought, what gave rise to it in the first place, is also being. In other words, we are being shown that the objects of our thinking or perceiving the end point and the result of the process, its final focus, is identical to its point of origin. The beginning and the end are the same. After this, the goddess speaks on other points attributed to being, and that is that it is unnameable. And this is a paradox in itself to even call it being. But she says that its name shall be everything. This is a theme that runs again throughout culture and religions. For example, Lao Tzu, just around the time of Parmenides, mirrors this idea, writing, The unnameable is the eternally real. Naming is the origin of all particular things. The beauty is that there is no specific dogma included in Parmenides' message. It is open, whole, and full of everything. This absolutely destroys any notion of religion as separating being and creating a myth around it, according to Parmenides, is an illusion. If one truly widens their scope and takes in all cultures and religions, looking at their symbols and rituals, one will see this being at the root of it all. Some call it true religion, which Parmenides is speaking on. Speaking of, Carl Jung carved a Latin inscription at the door of his house in Kuznach, Switzerland, where it reads, Called or not called, the God will be there. And one could say God is being. Parmenides truly grasped the whole in this account of being. And in this wholeness, he says it's complete. While I'm going to remain vague with this section, as much of it is best for you to work through, I want to add a quote by Peter Kingsley, because one may be thinking, to be complete means that there's no meaning to life. It already is. In reality, Kingsley remarks, really to understand that we are trapped, held fast in bonds, that there is nowhere else to go, no possibility of transcendence, is devastating. It knocks the bottom out of everything we once thought we knew. All of a sudden, we are faced, inescapably, with the horrifying reality of what before might have seemed such an attractive ideal, the terrors of completeness. For in the experience of completeness, there is nothing to become. There is nothing else to look forward to. The endless searching is over. The greatest trick of existence is to make us forget we are trapped because then we are hopelessly trapped. When we keep believing we are free, that's bondage. 
And paradoxically, the greatest freedom of all lies in knowing, without the smallest room of doubt, that one is trapped, because then the struggling and pretending stops. This is that idea I was speaking on earlier, about an empty ego, and the remark that the only way up is down. I think you're starting to see the message. From being in truth, we now shift from here on out to the world of creation, opinions, and half-truths. As the great Chinese Taoist mystic Lao Tzu stated about 200 years after Parmenides wrote this fragment, great thinking sees all as one, small thinking breaks down into the many. But with this said, I don't want to dismiss the many, as this is the part of the world we live in. The goddess includes this for a reason. She didn't stop after being and tell Parmenides to be tucked away in a monastery in the stillness of oneness, but also interact in this world of the many. And for Parmenides himself, we remember the goddess instructing him to carry her message back. If he were to sit in solitude with being and dismiss the many, then he wouldn't be sent back. She would keep him in the underworld, so to say. Yes, most of this poem is favoring the mystical oneness of being, but the other side of this poem cannot be overlooked. If so, the whole message is lost. Then again, we must be very careful in balancing these two, especially when one is taking this work serious. I found an interesting quote in the footnotes of Peter Kingsley's book, Catafalque, where he speaks about true imagination and false imagination. Many doing their inner work, say meditating, or more specifically, for this quote, active imagination, may be in the way of allowing what is to come through. Many have their own hidden desires that muck it up. Peter Kingsley highlights that Henry Corbin, who is known for his imaginal, similar if not one with Jung's active imagination, was tired of the Jungians at the end of his life and said before dying that Jungian psychologists are totally incapable of distinguishing between the true visionary nature of the imaginal and the worthless self-indulgence of the imaginary. The great irony here is that the person who gave the most powerful impetus to Corpin's own distinction between the imaginal and the imaginary was none other than Carl Jung. I read this to highlight the deception that's at the root of the second way. We've spoke about it with the programming and other points in the beginning, but it's important to remember that we must embrace it, yet not get trapped in it. And trapped in it, as Corpin states, many Jungians become. Jung knew it himself, as he is said to have made the comment that he is glad he is Jung and not a Jungian. Fragment 8 concludes with the world of creation, the conflicted nature of consciousness, the opposites, which lead us to much confusion, and this leads to our distinguishing and naming of things. What's important to highlight in this section is that she does not want Parmenides to be outwitted, fooled by the judgment of mortals. I don't know if Parmenides did this willingly, but it is as if the goddess begins with a solid truth about being, eternal reality, before getting into the particulars. This groundness into oneness, before approaching the opposites, allows one not to get fooled by their opposing nature. Rather, again, seeing it as a whole, one will not get easily astray to a pole, just as she says the masses have gone. So as we continue, one will notice that many of these fragments about the opinions of mortals have been lost, some fragments only a mere half a sentence. So while we were blessed to have a good portion of this beginning, of this idea of what is in being, it is unfortunate that we've lost much of this second section. And because of this, I will go rather quickly through the remainder of the fragments. Fragment 9 signifies a point previously said, as she speaks on the oneness of the opposites. If neither one nor the other is present, there is nothing, and this speaks volumes. Taking it on a psychological level, you could see the idea of Jung's shadow. He saw that everything has an opposite, especially psychologically. And if we don't see it, it doesn't just leave us, but rather haunts us. To get a good taste of Jung's connection to this, I'll quote his red book where he speaks of good and evil. You suffer from evil because you love it secretly and are unaware of your love. You wish to escape your predicament 
and you begin to hate evil, and once more you are bound to evil through your hate, since whether you love it or hate it, it makes no difference. You are bound to evil. Evil is to be accepted. What we want remains in our hands. What we do not want, and yet is stronger than us, sweeps us away, and we cannot stop it without damaging ourselves, for our force remains in evil. Thus we probably have to accept our evil without love or hate, recognizing that it exists and must have its share in life. In doing so, we could deprive it of the power it has to overwhelm us. So you could see here not only the idea of the opposites and embracing both, but even the point of the bindings and being bound. So fragment 10, 11, 12, and 13 are rather difficult to grasp without much context. This doesn't mean they're completely insignificant as they speak on elements, astrology, cosmology, creation, and all other ideas on this second way of inquiry. But without the context, it's impossible to go further. In fragment 14, I'd say it's one of my favorite poetic lines of Parmenides. Night shining, foreign light, wandering around earth. Before I reveal what he's speaking on, think about it. What could this be? Of course, it's tied to astronomy. It's tied to the sky, the heavens. It's the moon. On this, I found a quote. If we are right to believe that it was he, Parmenides, and not Thales, who was the first to argue that the light of the moon is borrowed from the sun, this foundational discovery in the field of astronomy is another sign of his commitment and empathy with nature. If the reports about his identification of the morning and the evening star and of the Earth's being round are reliable, further proof is provided of his pioneering study of the system of the heavens. The fact alone that these views came to attribute it to him is proof of the high esteem he won as a student of nature. While we've spoken much about the inner connection, we also see an outer connection to nature through Parmenides. And it allows him to truly understand what is. And when you compare this to our times, where a significant percentage of the population has lost this connection to outer nature and are huddled up inside, packed in cities, dependent on smartphones for intelligence, one can see how truly lost we've become. Again, fragment 15 doesn't have much context, so we'll continue to fragment 16. And this is a lovely little fragment of which seems to speak about consciousness as a structural substance of the organs. And it is thought which keeps them in order. Thought I can only imagine is divine intelligence, such as the intelligence of the heart to pump blood. Regardless, there is a rather metaphysical connection to the physical here. A connection that we've seemed to lose in mainstream thought. But again, this is all personal opinion, as this is all that remains of Fragment 16. Fragment 17 seems to speak about the idea of the placement of the seed in the womb and childbirth, but again, not much is available. Fragment 18 is also difficult to follow, but there's a beautiful sense of balance and unity in birthing, not only in the physical level, of the two sexes and within the seed and uterus, but also in the sense of the energetic level, the quantum level being balanced. And fragment 19, the final fragment ends with these things without being told any idea of what these things are. Regardless, it is the nature of opinion or belief, because as previously said, the opinion or belief is only true if it passes through all there is. The nature of an opinion or belief is that one's consciousness is bound to it. But the beauty of this poem is that unless the opinions or belief reach being, they vanish. They will all come to an end because the only thing that remains is eternity. To truly summarize this poem as a whole, there's one word that contains it, and it's consciousness. It is what holds reality together. It is what doesn't move. It is what doesn't need anything. It is eternal. And it doesn't arise from nothing. Consciousness is what we experience objectively and subjectively. 
And every point he makes, there's a root connected to consciousness. Mortals have opinions about consciousness, as well as a universal consciousness which holds reality together. And it is consciousness, from lower mortal levels to divine levels, that have differing shades of logos or intelligence in eros and longing. Higher longings lead to higher intelligence, higher intelligence to higher longings, whereas lower longings lead to the inverse, as well as lower intelligence. Just think about where we began. If longing is a natural phenomena which is there in the beginning, then we have everything we need to get there. Because whenever there is longing, Logos is also present. These two are eternally bound. This idea was picked up in Plato's work as knowledge is not to be learned, but re-remembered. There's nothing outside us, no dogma, no discipline, no formula to get you back there. Because only you have distorted its unfoldment. This is a true relief, as everything is already there, awaiting you. This ends the need to fulfill, the pull of others selling you a lie. This is the end of opinion, this is the end of belief, the end of religion, and the beginning of a logic that's connected to its true natural essence, a longing for the whole life of what is. As I stated in the introduction, purification and of course a sacrifice are required. It's a prerequisite, or else one will be twin-headed. Blind in death, wandering around nowhere, longing for quick stimulations and artificial intelligence. Now, it may be nice to sit back and read about Parmenides or Jung, but I don't make this material for mere entertainment. Rather, I use their reflections to get you reflecting. I pose you this question. Is individuation, is an initiation only for the few, only for the rich? The beautiful? God looks upon the earth and says, Oh Carl, you are the only chosen one. No. Parmenides' poem explains that the one is in all. This inner work is available for anyone. Being cannot be cut off from being. All that it requires is you. Go through these fragments and allow them to unfold. Don't just take my word for it and move on. Grasp the paradoxes, the difficult to understand phrases. Understand what he means by the essence of what is. Being. See if you see consciousness, subjective and objective, throughout the poem. If you notice the subtle hints to quantum reality. What I'll leave you is this. Jung began his red book with a chapter titled, The Way of What Is to Come. And we just read a poem about the way of what is. Will it come? I thank you for watching this video. Please comment below some thoughts on the poem and add some depth to points I've missed. Also, give it a like and share it with others who may enjoy to help get this message out. I appreciate all the support and look forward to the next video. Until then, stay humble.